media as well, and also the presentations will be published. You will all receive a link to this uh, once uh, the webinar is over. Um, the, you can, you are free to ask questions and type them at any time you like onto the chat box that you can find on the right uh, bottom corner of your screen. Uh, but you can also adjust the screen settings so that you have, uh, you know, you can decide where to have your video, what, how big the, the chat box is and so on. So I wanted to give you all, your, all this practical information to start so you know that uh, this is all being recorded. And if you miss something, don't worry, you will have access to that later on. So my name is Maria Kello. I am the director of ENQA, which is the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. And I'm the moderator of the webinar today. Uh, and I have three speakers uh, who are Tia Lokola, Director of Institutional Development at the European University Association, EUA. Samir al Zedi, Policy Officer at NAFIC. Uh, and Colin Tuk, who is the Director of ECAR. So welcome to all the speakers, uh, first of all. So the title of today's uh, webinar is Plugging the Information Gap, Facilitating Recognition Through Access to External Quality Assurance Results. Um, it is, of course, important when we talk about recognition uh, in academic context that there is reliable and easy access to information about institutions and programs to know whether they are actually good institutional programs. And with good, we mean that they have been externally reviewed um, in a quality assurance or, or accreditation procedure in line with the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area, which we call the ESG for short. So this webinar will explore how the recently launched database of external quality assurance results, it's called DECWAR, um, aims to make this information more readily accessible and available by collecting in one place all reports and decisions produced and published by quality assurance agencies that are registered in ECWAR, which is the European Quality Assurance Register for Higher Education. So hopefully we'll have this one one-stop shop where all reports of all institutions and programs that have been externally quality assured by those agencies are available. So we'll hear more about the database, but also what kind of use could be uh, there for the database beyond recognition issues. Uh, and, but we proceed step by step on that. Um, so now I will have uh, the three speakers present and I'll have a little bit of time after each of them for your direct questions related to that presentation. And we will also have some time at the end to have a discussion and ask and answer hopefully further questions on the topic. So I would now like to hand over to Thea Lokola uh, from EUA, who will start uh, our webinar with the presentation uh, on the institutional perspective on recognition and the link to the Thank you, Maria. Uh, yes, it is my pleasure to start the webinar by uh, providing you a little introduction to the topic of recognition and why we talk about it and why, for instance, European University Association has been working on this topic and, and to whom is this relevant, the, the idea of recognition. Um, First of all, why does recognition matter? In Europe, we have a polit political commitment to, um, to have quite considerable number of our students mobile by 2020. 20% 20 should, should be mobile by 2020. Uh, that will be next year. We are not close to the target yet. And one of the issues that often comes up in uh, in different policy discussions is that the recognition is not working ideally. The students or applicants' rights are not really um, being fulfilled in a way, if one may say so. Um, the students uh, who are mobile during their studies or, ap uh, or applicants to further studies, let's say at the, at the master's level, for instance, don't necessarily have the feeling that they don't get their uh, formal qualifications or studies recognized uh, in, in due course or in, in a proper manner. So there is work to be done. Um, why is this important for higher education institutions? 
Well, for the simple reason that in most most European countries, in uh, 38, if I remember correctly, out of the 45, the Euro uh, higher education institutions are ultimately responsible for the recognition of foreign qualifications for academic purposes. You can see on screen a map where the light beige uh, countries are the ones where institutions are in charge of this activity. Uh, the framework for recognition is in principle pretty clear. We do have Risperd Recognition Convention, which dates before uh, Bologna process, in fact. It was uh, already adopted in 1997. And in principle, the, the recognition in line with the Lisbon Recognition Convention is considered as one of the key commitments in Bologna process. And the, it is a legal document. Uh, it gives you quite practical uh, knowledge of what should be happening when you consider recognition. Most recently, the European Council has provided a recommendation um, last uh, November where the EU member states committed to automatic recognition. So on paper, it does look like we've got it all figured out, but in practice, it doesn't really work. For instance, looking at the system level automatic recognition, which is the commitment in the EU countries, the map looks like this. Um, for most of us, it's pretty clear that green means you are doing well, it's positive, and red means a contrary, let's, let's say it so. So in many European countries, there is no automatic recognition. What does that automatic recognition mean? It would mean that if we have a bachelor in Denmark, we consider it a bachelor in, in Germany. Or the, if you have a bachelor in, uh, in Spain, uh, the Finnish authorities or and higher education institutions consider it a bachelor and recognize it as a bachelor in their system as well. And the idea is that quality assurance would play a, play a role in this, all this, because the, the basic concept is that if everybody has gone through the same quality assurance procedures, we have agreed that uh, this and this uh, certain criteria it needs to be fulfilled in order for it to be a bachelor, then it would be easy for us to recognize it as, as applicants and students are mobile. However, we took, uh, at EUA we took part in a project uh, a few years ago where we looked into the institutional practices in how this is really done. And we did find out that there is quite a lot of variety in within the institutions, uh, between the institutions and within the institutions on how recognition is carried out. And importantly enough, we found out that there is um, considerable need for um, capacity building and awareness raising about the expectations, about what, for instance, Lisbon Recognition Convention talks about and what you're expected to do when you get an application. Another important finding in that project was that uh, we, there should be more tools, information and support for higher education institutions for their recognition work. Uh, institutions don't necessarily know what is expected of them and then they find, uh, and when they do know what is expected of them, they find that it's uh, quite difficult to uh, get information for instance, about the qualifications. So let's say information about the external quality assurance um, uh, results is difficult to uh, get and you don't know where to go and find it if you don't work with these matters every day. And this is where probably, and the hope is that the DECWAR database will jump in. This was my short introduction to the topic, Maria. Um, thank you very much, Thea, for the uh, presentation and kind of clarifying the point of view of the institutions on that. Um, I don't see any questions coming from the participants, but luckily I have some of my own. Okay. Um, so you mentioned, uh, yes, that hopefully DECAR will help institutions in meeting this need for more tools and more support. Uh, could you just briefly say what kind of resources of support and tool did the universities use until now, and how do you estimate they will use of DECAR? 
Um, well, I think mo mo in most cases the institutions look into their uh, national enigmatic information centers. So, uh, in all the countries uh, in Europe, uh, there is a national uh, center for recognition information. Call them typically enigmatic. Um, they are in charge of providing information about the recognition and. In most cases, what we found out is that the institutions either consult the, the, the centers for individual cases or the centers have set up the databases on, on, on the basis of their own work in recognition work. Often these are responsible for the professional recognition of qualifications. Um, so, the, there, there are various databases uh, set up by the enigmatics, but that also means that they don't usually cover all countries or they just cover those that are more relevant for, for, the, for, for their own work. Um, what was your second question? Well, how will Descartes be a game changer in this respect? And also, if I may add kind of a, a perspective, will the people in the institutions who deal with recognition be able to understand the reports that through Descartes will be accessible and being a bit provocative. You are being a bit provocative. Um, Descartes can be a game changer in, in cases where, so one of the, let, let me say, uh, one of the key issues that you typically look at when you get a qualification, and here I am sorry, I'm going to the domain of the next speaker, but we assume that one of the things you want to know is whether the, the program from which the qualification comes from is recognized in their own country. In other words, is it accredited in that particular country? It is, a, is it a legitimate uh, higher education institution that has um, awarded the degree or the qualification? Uh, now you have a database where you can find all the institutions, well, you should be able to find once it is finalized, uh, all the institutions and uh, that ha have undergone um, external quality assurance in line with the EST. And this should help the, the recognition officer to know whether this is a legitimate institution or, or a program. Of course, there are limitations, and um, I think we can probably discuss it in the end of the, the session even more. The, is it understandable? That depends on the recognition officer's um, knowledge of quality assurance landscape because we do have a huge variety of quality assurance approaches and uh, languages, uh, um, whether you understand the languages in which the re reports are written. A lot of questions still prevail, uh, but I think it is a good start that we do have the at least the reports are in one place. You don't have to go and look for them in all agencies pages around Europe. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much, Tia. We have actually now a question from uh, the uh, participants, but because it's a question I would like all the participants, mm -hmm. all the speakers to be able to address, I will leave that uh, for a little bit later in the final discussion. So we will keep note of that and we'll come back to that question. So, thanks very much, Tia. Uh, and I'd like to move over to our next speaker, Samer Alzeri, a policy officer from NAFIC in the Netherlands, um, who will talk a little bit more about recognition specifically. So, Samer, it's up to you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. I will try to say something uh, general uh, about recognition. So, I'll start with the uh, legal and, and regulating framework of uh, recognition, let's say, at least in Europe. Um, and then from there on, uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the, uh, the the practice of recognition, uh, where the main question will be, what do I need uh, to have? What kind of information do I need to have to be able to um, really assess uh, a foreign uh, diploma or uh, credential? But first of all, general general look, um, we have the Lisbon uh, Recognition Convention um, uh, that is the, the regulating framework for all the work uh, that, that, that we do in Europe when it comes to uh, international recognition. Um, 
the Lisbon Recognition Convention could also be uh, codified or uh, to be found in, in your national uh, rules and, and, and regulation laws about uh, higher education. So it, it stipulates actually um, how we want recognition to be, uh, to be, to be dealt with in, in Europe. But it is a legal, uh, very dense kind of uh, text. So we actually would like to have a translation of that, uh, of that uh, recognition text. And this translation uh, is, is there, and it is called the uh, Year Manual. So when we say Year Manual, we're talking about the uh, European Area of Recognition Manual, which is a very uh, comprehensive um, translation, I would say, of the principles uh, of the Lisbon uh, Recognition Convention um, into a methodology of international uh, recognition. So how do I uh, develop a, a, a real methodology based on, on uh, certain principles that I have? And uh, I said it is very uh, comprehensive, very, very detailed. And uh, so there was need for a more uh, practical day-to-day uh, -day, uh, translation, and that is uh, to be found in the year uh, Hay manual. So that will be the European uh, Recognition Manual for Higher Education, um, Higher Education Institutes. I'm sorry, and that is again a translation of the uh, principles of um, uh, Lisbon into really practical day-to-day -day, um, methods and, and guidelines for the credential evaluator and the uh, admission officer at, at the university uh, who are really uh, day by day uh, assessing foreign credentials. So we have the, the principles in, the, in, the, in, in Lisbon uh, recognition convention. We have the first translation, very comprehensive, the year manual, and then the practical uh, a translation meant for the uh, credential evaluators and the uh, uh, admission officers. Um, last but not least, uh, maybe to mention the uh, the INECNARIC uh, centers. These are uh, information centers uh, throughout uh, Europe uh, who are responsible for uh, recognition in, in, in general, but also for um, implementing the uh, principles of the Lisbon Recognition Convention uh, nationally. I will then move on to the, let's say, more practical uh, part of this uh, short presentation, and, and that is how do I assess um, a, a diploma, a foreign uh, diploma? And I'm saying five elements uh, of an authentic qualification. I'm stating authentic because the, 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 that the authenticity is uh, just another area that, you, that needs to be, uh, to, to be covered, but we will not be uh, talking about that today. So I'll just keep the five elements of a qualification that is, let's say, already uh, known to be authentic. Uh, the first thing I would like to know is the level of that qualification in the uh, educational system where it comes from. Um, the second thing is the, the workload. So how, uh, how much work does it uh, did, did go into, um, into a certain study program that was finished by that uh, diploma that I have on my table? Uh, then I would like to know something about the quality. And I'll come back uh, to discuss all those points a little bit more on, with little more details. Um, then the profile and the learning icons. So let's let's look at them one by one. Uh, the level of uh, qualification. If I have a, a qualification from a certain country, I would like to know what is the uh, place of that qualification in that country. If if I don't know that, I cannot understand how it is to be translated in in my own national uh, framework. For that, we have in Europe. It's it's uh, much easier than than with other countries. Um, we have different. Uh, Frameworks, so we can quite uh, easily understand where a certain qualification is. Uh, we have, we, we all know the bachelor, master, and and, uh, and a PhD. Um, and we also know the um, entry requirement for each program, so that places the diploma or the credential in a, a first glance somewhere in that educational system. The workload is. Let's say uh, I have, I will need three years full time to finish a bachelor. 
um, that could be um, codified by, uh, let's say, ECTS or something like that. Um, the quality, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail, maybe, um, is could be seen as three things: the quality of the student, the uh, quality of uh, the study, the study program itself, and the uh, quality of the institution uh, awarding the the, um, the diploma uh, as as a whole. Let's say the institution itself. Maybe we will uh, work. We will work with uh, with rankings. We uh, don't think that from the perspective of Lisbon uh, Recognition Convention, um, rankings should be taken um, too strictly or too um, uh, as a really uh, regulating uh, tool uh, for 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 uh, for recognition. But it is it is possible to look at rankings when uh, when they are there. Uh, the the program should be. Um, of a certain quality, and then you should trust the um, the, the, the uh, quality insurance uh, organization in the certain country to, uh, let's say, have a certified uh, or a certain program to be certified uh, over there, and the uh, the, the quality of the uh, students uh, him him himself will be maybe shown uh, through his uh, or her grades. So we have the quality of the students uh, and, and the program and the um, and the institution in, in general. I think mostly we will be talking about the uh, the quality of the program um, to, today in, in this uh, webinar. Um, and then the best practice uh, from or from within the, the Lisbon Recognition Convention is that you uh, really trust the competent authority in a certain country to uh, do their work, and uh, if they say, "Okay, this program is," um, am I over time? You have a thirty seconds to wrap up. All right, all right. Um, if if they will state that uh, a certain program uh, really has a, a, a certain quality uh, level, uh, then then we should. Uh, trust that without this mutual trust uh, recognition is will, will really not be um, uh, possible our profile is very short to know let's say if something is um, is, is research or more um, applied sciences like and the learning outcomes is uh, to see how, uh, what what does somebody know um, how what is he able to understand and to demonstrate uh, I will stop right now maybe we can talk uh, a little bit more later about all those five elements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm very glad you mentioned one of the key elements uh, for, for us in quality and in recognition, which is trust. Um, and that is also what we try to achieve with this database that we have access to the information on quality. Um, and so I would like to invite the participants to keep the questions coming. Don't think that because we haven't picked up on any of them yet that we will not. We'll keep note of those questions we've received and we'll address them uh, at the end because I think they are best suited for that moment. Um, but in the meantime, as you think of your questions, I, I would indeed like to ask you a question. Do you, how, how do you make sure that you know about the quality of a program? What is your main source to get information on the quality of the program or the institution when you, when you do these kind of uh, recognition processes? Well, if, if, if I'd be, uh, let's say, um, training a new colleague at, a, at, an, 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 uh, at an institute who will be uh, an admission officer, I would simply say, OK, you should uh, check out the, the, uh, the website of the uh, e Enicneric centers, then see what can, which country are you dealing with. Now we're talking about European, uh, the European uh, system. Uh, then you will see which organization in that country is uh, the competent uh, organization to check the quality of a, of a study program and from then taken on with the uh, with that organization to to see if uh, let's say online uh, i can find information about the accreditation of that certain program in that case i will have a um, a, a way to check that at the uh, at the very base that i all trust so i i know i know wh where to find the information and i know that it is uh, trustworthy it becomes a little bit more complicated when I will be looking for a uh, program from uh, outside of uh, of the European uh, region. But even then, 
if if I know the uh, let's say the responsible ministry for uh, for for uh, uh, the program at the end, then th probably the ministry will gi will give me uh, some kind of information on which is the uh, competent authority of uh, who will check the, the quality of the program. And then again, I will, I will need to, to go and check if they uh, said that the, that program is or not uh, up to their standards. Very good. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, additional explanation. That's very useful. Um, I move uh, now next on to the next and final uh, input presentation before our final discussion to Colin Tuk from ECAR. And after the setting of the scene, mm -hmm. uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the database itself. So Colin, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maria, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I think um, uh, what we have heard before from uh, Tia and the general introduction already made quite clear why, uh, why we have started out to, to do this. I mean, uh, she explained already the, the goals of automatic recognition that make it very necessary to have easy, uh, accessible and understandable um, information on quality assurance. And we did find out uh, beforehand that uh, at uh, present or uh, previously, uh, quality assurance reports and decisions were not always easily accessible to people, especially uh, when they were looking in other countries. As we just uh, heard, you had to find your way around, find out where to look, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's why we set out to, um, uh, with DECPA to collect uh, all external quality assurance uh, reports and decisions from uh, registered agencies in one single place. I think it's important to uh, reiterate here also that that means that we are talking about reports by agencies that have been uh, demonstrated to work in line with our agreed European standards and guidelines, so called ESG for quality assurance. So we know that these agencies are agencies that we can actually trust based on the agreed framework that uh, has been adopted in the Bologna process. Um, before talking about the uh, database as such, I just want to highlight a few of our design principles. Uh, I think one imp very important one is. Uh, um, that we try to provide a lot of contextual information. We don't want to just uh, throw a bunch of reports out to users, um, but we also like to provide uh, contextual information on the system, where these reports come from, where they have been, um, where they have been published, uh, because we believe that's very important for users to uh, adequately understand what a report means. Uh, um, uh, another important point is that we want to keep the entry bar for uh, quality assurance agencies very low, so we don't want to make it too difficult for aqua registered agencies to to put their reports in, uh, so that uh, to facilitate uh, uh, getting a large number of reports. Uh, and finally, we want to be uh, sure that we reuse information that already exists out there, so that we don't start collecting information that already others have maybe collected much better than we could do. Um, and at the same time, make sure that the information that we uh, gather through DECWA uh, remains um, open to be reused by others uh, as well. Um, so uh, just to illustrate that um, a little bit more, um, we, uh, so in, in DECWA you find information on uh, higher education institutions and the quality assurance reports about those institutions and their programs. Um, but in the end of the day, we, we collect information that's coming from various sources and combine it. So we have information on national quality assurance systems, which is actually something that, that we create ourselves together with input from the uh, ministries and governments in the European higher education area. Uh, we have um, informa basic information on the higher education institutions, which is simply the name, the location, the website, and so on, uh, which we actually get from uh, two existing European projects, the European Tertiary Education Register and the Register of Public Sector Organizations. So we didn't need to, to re collect this so that we could reuse it. And finally, we, we collect from the registered agencies their quality assurance uh, reports themselves. Um, and uh, in addition to reusing this information, we also we are quite keen that DECWA is uh, open to be embedded and reused by others. So I'll show you later that we can download the whole data from our website uh, and also others can integrate it into their own, into their own website, into their own application because we have a public um, application programming interface, which is uh, basically an uh, industry standard interface uh, which everyone can use and basically everyone who wants can use the same interface that our own website is using so you can get the full live access um, to the results. Um, now, uh, before showing you the thing in practice, just a brief a summary of the coverage or the key figures uh, 
where we stand. We have um, almost 11,000 uh, quality assurance reports in DECRA at the moment. They uh, cover a bit more than 1,500 uh, higher education institutions. In total, spread over 56 countries, but important, I think more important than the total number is that we have 14 uh, European countries. That's the one you see in the um, darkest shades of blue on this map, um, where we cover uh, more than 50% of the higher education institutions in the country. And in many cases, it's, uh, it's actually 100% or close to 100%. That means you can find quality assurance information on uh, all, almost all universities and uh, colleges in those uh, countries in the database already. Um, so now, as, um, uh, as it's not uh, the most exciting to just uh, listen to a presentation, I really want to show you uh, how things actually look in practice. So if you, I'll share my screen with you to um, to demonstrate to you a bit how DECRA works on the on the actual site. So if you go to the website www.decra.eu, um, you will end up on the landing page of the database, which just basically gives you an overview of uh, how many higher education institutions like quality assurance reports you have in a number of countries. Sorry, um, to, yeah? to interrupt you. we are not seeing your screen, so maybe you can try again to share. Oh, to sh wait, I, hold on, hold on. Um, you see it now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Sorry. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, well, the only thing you missed, I entered www.dequa.eu in the address bar, and that leads me not to this page, um, but to this landing page where you actually get an overview of countries and the number of higher education institutions uh, with quality reports in there. So, let's have a look at uh, Romania, for example. Um, if you just click on Romania, you get the list of all um, higher education institutions in the country. Um, for which we have at least one or more quality assurance report. I just open one of them and uh, you see that you have some basic information on the institution that we just copied from ETA, we didn't uh, do that ourselves. Um, you'll have a short profile of the national quality assurance system. That's what I said, it's very important to get the context, uh, not only the report itself. And then you see a number of reports which can be institutional accreditations or can be uh, individual program accreditations or evaluations. Um, you also see for each report a little logo which uh, shows you that it's uh, part of the official quality assurance system and you see actually a small icon that shows you whether it's a positive or a negative result if I mean and then you can open it to see the details about the program which it is about which agency has carried it out uh, and uh, quite importantly of course from when to when it's valid so it's uh, it's quite important but still a, a very uh, limited set of information which we try to really make sure we only show the essentials here and uh, refer people um, to the full reports for detail. If you're on the search page, you can also just uh, search for a city. Let's take Tallinn, for example. Um, and you see the high education institutions located in that, uh, in that city. And for instance, we can look at the Estonian Academy of Arts and we see again a small profile of the Estonian quality assurance system. We see they actually have an institutional accreditation and then they have a couple of study program groups uh, accredited. So you see that every country has slightly different approaches which are reflected in uh, the database. Now, if we uh, want to actually read more about Estonia, we can also go directly to the country page of Estonia where we have uh, the full picture, full description of the uh, national external quality assurance systems uh, and also some other information and links to further information, for instance, to the Anagnaric uh, website and uh, to others. Um, well, if we switch to another country just to show some more examples, for instance, in Spain, uh, you can also see that there are a lot of different agencies in Spain because they have a regionally based system and they can also go here directly to see uh, uh, institutions that have quality assurance reports from one of the agencies operating in the country. Uh, so, for instance, I can look at the Autonomous University of Barcelona Let's have a look at the Faculty of Law. You actually see that uh, they are um, a bit more uh, granular um, represented because they they sorted sorted by each and uh, every faculty. And again, you see a list of uh, accredited study programs that does faculty and uh, uh, information uh, uh, from uh, 
about the agency of uh, which they were accredited, which in this case is the Catalan University uh, Quality Assurance Agency. If you access the whole information from actually our general register of agencies, you, you can also search a bit more in detail already. Uh, so let's take, for instance, RCM, and you can see they have a special EuroInf joint program with you, which is a European label for informatics. Um, and you can see, for instance, uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in Kaiserslautern has one program that has that label, and you see that it's actually a joint program, which is also indicated by a special icon, and you can also see immediately that it's a joint program with another university that's been accredited with that uh, label. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you can also find a page on the DECO website where you can download the whole data. Um, I will not do that right now because it's maybe not the most exciting to show you a gigantic uh, Excel sheet. Um, but you can go here and download the, um, the full set of uh, quality assurance reports in, in one big spreadsheet. And uh, you can use that for further analysis uh, and so on. And finally, you also have an, uh, uh, the description of the application interface, which others could use. Um, so that uh, was basically a short presentation in live. Now, oh. I wanted to go back to my final slide. Oh, wonderful. Uh, um, so uh, just to wrap up uh, what's in uh, DECO for you, I, mean, it's, uh, I think we have, uh, it's become clear today that of course the main target groups are uh, recognition officers and agnostic centers because we discussed uh, they really need that kind of information on a daily basis, but also uh, students uh, might need information when they decide where to study, higher education institutions when looking for partners, and many, many other uh, stakeholders uh, or target groups uh, might need to access quality assurance information and uh, yeah, can benefit from all that being uh, available now in one single place for quite a number of agencies already. Um, so uh, just to uh, tell what's coming up in the future, we're actually working on also more advanced search functions. So you will have a uh, yeah, functionality on the website to search even more uh, granular for certain programs, uh, so, so certain uh, reports, um, and you'll also have a possibility to use some uh, real-time infographics and charts. And finally, if you're um, interested in doing any kind of research or analysis tomorrow on DECO data, we're having a call for paper that's still open for a couple of more days. Uh, and if uh, you're interested, you might present your ideas or your work in progress at our final conference in October this year. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Colin, for the informa informative presentation on DECAR. It's very good to hear, and it's good to hear also that DECAR is not only for the enigmatic recognition officers, which of course uh, hopefully will use the, the database a lot, but it can be uh, used by many other users for many different purposes. So uh, questions are coming in, some of them, that's very good, keep them coming. Um, I would just like to say that we think as ENQA, as the association of agencies, that such a, a collection point of reports is a very useful tool. Um, but indeed, I, it will be important, the uh, test will be put by the time, so that we will be sure that it really covers um, updated reports uh, and uh, as widely as possible across Europe. I think that will be uh, that will be the real test in the longer term. But um, the results so far has been very encouraging. Uh, we've been very impressed by the number of agencies that have been already able to feed into the database with either a good part or all of their reports for the past few years. So I think that is a very good result to start with. So. We have a few questions on the board, but before we get into those, I would like to invite Tia, who is next to me, to join us back in the discussions, um, as well as Summer. And so, Summer, could you activate your video again, please, so we can see you as well. So, welcome back. Uh, we had a question already quite early on posted on the, on the chat box on how could stakeholders better engage with the NICNARIC organizations? To make sure that recognition is really smooth. So I would like to start on this question with Summer because I think you have the most direct contact with any generics. What's your view on that? How can we together as stakeholders make the recognition smoother? I, I would like to know a little bit more obviously about which uh, kind of stakeholders because like 
in the situation the, the situation where I work from in the Netherlands, we have contact, uh, very close contact with with the uh, institutions of higher education. Uh, we have very good contact with our colleagues in, in other European countries, um, and and we do have uh, uh, good contacts with the organizations in the Netherlands that are. Uh, for instance, uh, responsible responsible for all kinds of work uh, when it's uh, when it comes to refugees. So when 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 we're working on that um, issue, we have contact with the stakeholder that is uh, relevant. So who are we talking uh, about before setting a network? Obviously, there should be a a, a network, uh, a way to uh, approach an Eric Center. Um, but if if the question could be a bit more specific, then yeah. yes, maybe maybe I can continue from that because I, I think uh, the the thing here uh, the question was both at national and European level, and I have just spent a couple of days in a European uh, level uh, Bologna follow up group uh, recognition uh, peer learning uh, group uh, and its meeting and. Um, it became clear that, uh, for instance, your colleagues somewhere in, uh, in, in the meeting were t saying that they have, you have regular contact with, uh, with the university admission officers and uh, that you have meetings and uh, someone from your, unit, uh, your, your organization goes to the institutional meetings where they... That's me. Yeah, I see you. Okay. Because I heard that there is someone who goes to the meetings. So I think this was something that uh, what we learned in those conversations is that doesn't exist everywhere. So actually it was picked up as one of the good practices that the others could also start doing that. There are ethnarics um, that uh, then, for instance, invest more in uh, online uh, information provision. Uh, but it was considered as good practice that nothing does that uh, you, you really have a contact and you go to meetings and the, I understood that the university admission officers from different universities meet as well, that they exchange experiences. Yes. Yeah. So they, 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 like we have a, a real network of admission officers, um, uh, two actually, uh, two, two of them. So we have the research universities and the University of Applied Sciences. They, ch they share information and we, uh, we are always uh, there at, at, at such a meeting and they're on a really regular basis. I was in, in Brussels uh, two weeks ago and there was uh, a mention of uh, uh, other colleagues in, in another country where uh, people maybe could not reach as easily out for the for the NARIC center uh, and and we all we actually called for the organization of such a network we think it's very really beneficiary uh, both ways because we can um, uh, simulate the, uh, the, the the principles of the Lisbon recognition convention but we also can get feedback directly from the uh, admission officers on what is happening on the on the ground and what are the problem the problems uh, that they're facing yeah. Yeah. In this uh, Bologna follow-up uh, recognition group, actually the European Student Union and the university organizations, we take part in it and we've, we have some uh, preliminary ideas on how to improve the dialogue also in, uh, at European level, but uh, more about that when we, they become concrete. Hmm. Good idea. Don't promise too much before you know you can <laughs> yeah. fulfill your promises. There's actually a question that was already made while Tia was speaking, but I would like to first uh, post that to Colin and then see if Tia wants to fill in on that. So there is a question saying, why do you think that the centralized approach is better than the decentralized ENIC NARIC approach? So I suppose the question is, why DECAR instead of these decentralized approaches by, by any narics? So Colin, what's your response to that? Well, I think uh, two points. First of all, I think it's not, uh, um, the, um, it's not that I think the centralized approach is better instead of the any narics. It's just, I think, an addition. So I think it's an additional tool that makes it easier also for any narics and for others to uh, um, to find the information they need. So I think it's not an instead of, but an, ad an addition to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe one related point, I think it's, uh, um, as uh, we've been said before and come out of some other comments, uh, 
it's not only the anagnarics who actually make the recognition decisions, because the anagnarics in, in many places advise the institutions and institutions in the end make the decisions. So I think it's, it's also important for, for other actors to, to get this information, because um, maybe for, for, let's say, simple cases where we have a, a European degree coming from a European higher education area country uh, that's uh, uh, using the agreed qualification framework, uh, they might not even need to ask a specific question about that individual case to the anagnarics. They can just go on the database, see, okay, it's accredited, the institution is accredited, or the degree itself, and uh, uh, we uh, can move that student to the next step for the admission process. We don't need to uh, bother contacting an anagnarics or contacting anyone else outside. Yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah. Okay. You want yeah. to add something? Maybe just to add something. I, I think they are they are kind of a complementary approaches. Uh, I think, uh, and I think, that, for instance, Summer explained earlier that you know when you look at the quality, you go to the to the website of the organization who is in charge of the quality assurance in that particular higher education system. Um, I think for those who don't work on this on a regular basis, let's say every day, or don't. Um, it, it's difficult to know which organization in each country is responsible for the quality assurance. I think some of the, you know, for instance, uh, Colin had this example of Spain when you were illustrating the database that um, in Spain you have a lot of agencies. Uh, if you have a qualification coming from Spain and you don't know exactly which organization the the uh, institution in question might be working on, then it may be difficult to know which uh, which organization's website to go to. Right. So now you have it all yeah. as illustrated by Colin on the database. Oh, right. Hopefully, that's at least the idea that that's why this would help both yeah. the institutions and any Um I have a, an, another question because indeed what we were saying is that uh, Colin, you underlined that Becca is not only for the any clerics, but then you rushed through that part a little bit. Could you just briefly explain a little bit what are the main other main um, uses that you foresee for DECAR and how could institutions and in particular perhaps students, others take, uh, take advantage of those other uses or benefits? Yes, uh, sure. Um, so uh, I think one, uh, uh, to start with students, uh, was to, which is actually a very diverse group. It might include uh, potential students, it might uh, include current students, it might uh, also include student union uh, representatives or student union activists. So it's a, quite a broad group. Um, they might use the DECA to find information about uh, whether, for instance, an institution where they consider to study, or where they consider to go for mobility abroad, has actually been quality assured in line with the uh, agreed European framework. Um, uh, similarly, higher education institutions, other than, I think, admissions officers in the institutions, they might also use that uh, to benchmark themselves with other partners, or they might uh, look up information about potential partners uh, before they, or why they discuss with them about partnerships, uh, or they just might see, okay, how do similar institutions in other countries, how, how are they assessed in their, uh, in their quality uh, audit reports, uh, for example. Um, and quality agencies, they might use it if, uh, if they are asked to evaluate an institution in another country, they can see what kind of reports they've already had. Where they can find out that uh, they have been just asked to accredit a program that's already been rejected by five other agencies. Um, and finally, I think maybe one to highlight uh, researchers, because that got a bit lost. Uh, researchers might really use the information to, uh, um, to analyze uh, quality assurance in different countries and to have uh, maybe easier time to have comparative analysis and quality assurance in different countries because things are a bit more uh, presented in a harmonized uh, structure. Um, and you can even uh, try to use that data and correlate it with other data sets. For instance, you have a lot of microdata about higher education institutions in this ETA, this European Tertiary Education Register. Staff numbers, student numbers, mobility rates, all that kind of things. Uh, so you could try, uh, you can even uh, map these two information sets next to each other uh, quite easily because they use the same identifying uh, codes uh, at the end of the day. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, I think, yes, Sarah, I will get back to you in a second. The, the whole, oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, the whole question is, is not actually 
as as you said um, in the beginning, it it doesn't have to be that this or that because the information itself is the same. The presentation could be uh, a duplicate or um, found at two different places, but the information itself will will stay will stay the same. So it's um, it, it may may even even be a beneficiary for uh, credential evaluators uh, outside of Europe. Uh, we're talking about here in, in economics, but let's say in another country, uh, they might also find it very uh, useful to have all the information in one place. But the essential thing is whether you get to it through the Inicneric website and then the, uh, the, 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 the quality insurance uh, organization or through uh, ACAR, the information will stay the same. Yeah, that's a very good point, Summer. Thank you for that. Um, and I think also, Colin, just to add what you said about the researchers, of course, it's nice to give material to researchers, but we should remember that, of course, the researchers produce something that will then be further um, useful and interesting for yet another group of, of people. We could imagine uh, national policymakers, uh, European policymakers, etc. So, of course, not research just for the sake of research, but to produce something useful for the sector. So, indeed. Uh, we have a question now on the reports themselves. I had also listed one related to that uh, uh, in my paper. Um, there's a question that says our admissions officers find it difficult to orient it into these long accreditation reports. And we know that ourselves, the reports are not always easy to access if you're not, uh, not a professional of the sector. So is it possible to simplify the reports that are published on DECAR? What can we make so that the information contained there is more easily accessible. Colin, maybe you could start. Um, yes, um, uh, I, I, I noticed that question before and I think it, it's maybe a little bit related to some other question I saw popping up also about uh, harmonizing the information. Uh, on the one hand, I think, um, uh, of course, that's barely something that DECPO itself can do. I mean, we can't uh, tell people how to publish information, but I think uh, for, for in the first place, looking at language, we currently have reports in many different languages because uh, that's uh, the way in which uh, institutions publish them. I think there, there might become a certain drive to publish more reports or at least summaries of reports in English because they become uh, much more available, much more easily accessible to a wider audience. Um, uh, on the other hand, we will also uh, we'll actually provide that, uh, an opportunity for those agencies that want to do it they can also put a small summary in, in, uh, into the database that you can see directly on the on the website, so you, that you could see um, uh, without having to go uh, open a long PDF file uh, somewhere. Um, but uh, another point about the admissions officer, I think, however, is also uh, a question of policy, of course, because uh, um, while I believe it's important that the reports are accessible and understandable. I think in many places it will be sufficient to know that an institution has been audited or that it has been accredited and you don't necessarily need to or want to read the whole report. Uh, and I think maybe that's an important point to uh, uh, to stress when we discuss this kind of questions of, uh, uh, of trainings, of uh, how um, you encourage institutions to do the recognition process, that we wouldn't expect someone uh, to, to read the report and sort of second guess their evaluation results if you get a degree from another European country that's been evaluated in line with the ESG. We should work on the problems that that itself is a good basis for trust and uh, even though the system might be slightly different, um, that's what we agreed upon. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Colin. I would like to ask here, in addition to being an employee of EUA, um, she's also um, running an evaluation program, so um, producing reports through experts, of course. So how do you see the implications? Is DECAR um, making you more aware that the readership might be much wider of your reports than, than in the past or than you would have expected? And are you considering somehow to... to adjust your reports to a new type of readership? Um, the short answer would be no, we are not considering <laughs> to change our reports. Um, I think the bigger uh, mental and practical step in changing the reports was when they were there was an obligation by the EST to publish them online. So already putting them on the agency website uh some years ago 10 years ago that was the big step then that's when we had really had conversations about the readability 
and uh, uh, of the reports and that okay now many pe more people may read them uh, in all honesty not many more people read them um and um, i would assume if i may speculate i would assume that uh, also in the future uh, the more important uh, thing uh, that the decor brings and what people will be uh, visiting is the summary you've got uh, that you showed um, the colleague when you were demonstrating the database where you can see the, the institution, the program and is the decision yes or no, uh, is it accredited. Whereas uh, then there will be less fewer people probably clicking on the report itself and reading it. But I do remember, Maria, that you used to have a project where I was in the advisory board uh, where you looked at the possibility of having a short, concise summary report for all European uh, uh, agencies. And it uh, turned out to be a bit of an uh, not feasible due to the diversity of approaches. Yeah, exactly. So. And because we like diversity, we don't like to impose anything standardized on anybody. But we are actively encouraging agencies to produce this kind of um, concise summary reports in a style that fits their own context in English, so that that might help in the future, little by little, to also make the reports more accessible. So our time of this short hour is getting to a close, um, and it's my task now to to thank you all, to wrap things up and thank the speakers. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Summer. Thank you, Tia, for your contribution. And thank you for the very many participants, of course, especially those uh, I thank you put forward their questions. But I see a very large number of participants and we are very happy about that. I hope this has been a useful session for all of you. And I would just like to remind you that the recording and presentations will be available shortly. Uh, a link will be sent to all of those who, who registered for this webinar, so you will be finding that in your mailbox very soon. So, thanks again, and uh, I hope you have a very nice end of the week. And I think most of you have a very warm weekend uh, and enjoy the summer. And uh, till the next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>